The weather seems to be cooperating and we have sunshine, there's a little breeze, but it's not too cold and it's not too hot. So we welcome you in the name of the Lord and we trust that God is going to presence himself in the power of his spirit in our service this morning and we just want him to come and visit and change us and make us more like Christ. So uh, before we uh, pray, uh, Cindy is going to come and read the scripture for us. Good morning. Our call to worship is from Psalm 40, verses 40, I'm oh, sorry, verses 4 through 10. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am. I have come, it is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Thank you, Cindy. Can we stand as we have our opening prayer? Let's stand together. Father, we, we thank thee that uh, we can come to you at the beginning of any service and ask you to guide and direct our thoughts. Bless our pastor as he opens the word today. May he be, you, be a channel of you to each one of us, our Father, to build us up in our faith and to reach out and touch people that maybe don't know you as Savior even today. And so, our Father, we thank thee for your Holy Spirit. We thank thee for your word that was read. We know that in ourselves we have nothing, but in Jesus Christ we have everything. Salvation, forgiveness, and uh, making our, our lives uh, change and to be more like Christ. So thank you for what you're going to do in our midst today. We just give this service to you and pray as the girls come and sing now that you'll just bless us as we worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I will ask the, oh, they're here. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a fine day today. Um, nice change in comparison to last week with all the rain. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited. The weather has me pumped. Uh, so we're going to open this service with a song, This Is The Day. to the Lord.
Friends, I want to add my greeting to Grants to welcome all of you here this morning. Feels like as the weather's getting better, so is our attendance. That's a good thing. So happy to see Leanne and Kim here. We've been missing you guys, so really happy to see you. We've been praying for folks who haven't been here for a while to come and to see them again. I'm trying to notice everyone. I'm sorry if I miss others, but particularly grateful for the opportunity that God has given us. Again, the, as, as the summer comes to a close, I start to have more meetings with our fellow churches and such. And so many of our other churches have been just had such a difficult time since the summer because they can't meet outside like we have. They've had to have multiple services or they've had to have particularly deep restrictions meeting indoors. And this is just such a blessing for us to be able to have this outdoors. And so as we said, we're hoping for the next few weeks right through until uh, Thanksgiving Sunday, we hope that we'll be able to be outside here. A number of you have your masks on and you're willing to, or you're welcome to do that, but you don't have to. So that's your call. Uh, you don't have to wear your masks outside. We do ask if you go inside, if you'll put them on, but the washrooms are certainly available for you there to be sure. But again, I'm grateful for you coming. Grateful again for a church family that understands the need to support our ministry financially. Uh, Emmy tells us that our numbers are just fine. They're never extraordinary, but they're fine. And that's what we need. God provides for our needs here at the church. And so you are God's hand and God's agency of grace in that. So be encouraged and please receive our thanks from the leadership in particular, as we're so grateful for you to continue to support the ministry. Glad again for the opportunity that we have in the coming weeks to connect with our other churches. One of the things I mentioned to you a while back, just to encourage you to keep in prayer, it's about three weeks from now. We'll be having our first meeting of the Toronto, uh, Fed Toronto Revitalization Network. And I mentioned to you that is a group of about six or eight other churches in our Feb denomination here in Toronto that are essentially looking together to say, what's next for our churches? What's the next move? Not, we've got tremendous difficulties, how do we get out of this? Versus, everything's just great, we don't have to give it any more thought. And we said most of our churches are somewhere in between those two poles. And so here at Downsview, we're actually going to be hosting this network. Tim Strickland, who is the Development Officer of Leadership for FEB, will be here leading the uh, group and the program. It's actually going to last right through this next year. We'll meet the first Wednesday of every month for three hours here at the church and some connection in between. And so if you'd pray for that, that we hope that this synergism of our churches meeting together will be helpful, not just for our brothers and sisters in Christ, but for us here at Downsview, perhaps in ways that go beyond what we've asked or imagined. Speaking of blessings that go beyond what we've asked or imagined, this Thursday, Renillo and Minda will be celebrating 35 years together of marriage. you guys take care of your wife brother she gets another medal you know for being married to you yeah I understand <laughs> thank you guys There's, we want always to be a church family that does celebrate and encourage that key picture of Christ's love for his church which is what marriage is and why marriage is actually here in the world so I've got a special announcement here for you let me just preface it by reading a few verses from the book of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 7 the Apostle Paul says of his ministry and reflecting all of us who have been called into vocational that is what our job is vocational ministry he says of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power to me Though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, given to me, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. For the last few years, I have had a brotherly relationship with Ilya Korchagin. The last number of years, we have had a real fellowship, these last four plus years since we've come to the church. In the last number of months, we have had an increasing, not just fellowship, but partnership in the gospel. And God seems to have a very clear and very significant call on Ilya's life. 
And so I've asked him if he would come and share what God is calling him to do, the consequences and repercussions of that. And he has asked, so that you know this, that he has asked for the opportunity to especially bless the Lord and give a word of thanks to our church family. So brother, please come. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I feel like it's it's been a while since I've been at Down Zoo uh, regularly, um, and even now it's still semi-regularly. But in any case, really happy to be back in person, especially and and outside. I don't think in the in the years that I've been here we've ever had consistent outdoor service. So this is good. As many of you remember from several weeks back, Pastor Peter mentioned about. Um, my departure and my next steps in life and so since that was a while ago and since I wasn't here for that and I was gone and I'll explain why I was gone and that's also a good thing that I plan to get to um, the two of us felt that it was appropriate for me to also have an, an opportunity to explain what that is and maybe flesh out some of the details because it was quite vague uh, from Pastor Peter's end because I guess we were just anticipating for this sort of opportunity. So to make a long story very short, and it is a long story, and it's a it's a wonderful story that I don't mind sharing. So you can feel free to ask me about it, or or you know if you have a, a more specific or pointed question. Uh, but the thesis of all of it is that um, I have decided to go into the ministry full time, not immediately. I'm kind of working on that piecemeal, but. I plan to enter the pastorate and the first uh, step in that is to enter seminary. However, I plan to do that uh, through a church that is not in Toronto, is sufficiently far from here, it's in Kingston, and through a denomination that isn't Baptist. Um, the, the details of that are when I moved away to Queens about five years, well, at this point, six, I think, years ago in 2015, uh, maybe some of you remember that. When you move away to a new place, especially for school, and you're young and impressionable, it can be hard to find a, a good church. And I didn't immediately find a good church. I was always going, but I, I, I didn't. It didn't happen instantly. Um, and so, in the years that I was there, I was very fortunate to have not only Down Zoo to come home to when I was here for the summers and things like that, uh, but also to have Hope Presbyterian Church in Kingston while I was there. Um, as I was. Uh, participating in worship there and in the ministry there, um, I realized that I had to maybe rethink certain things from the ground up. Um, and we're all trying to be good students of the word, and sometimes when we do that, we don't come to the same conclusions. So, call that maybe an unfortunate reality of the situation, but that is really the the reason of you know why I came to where I came to. The the pastors there, not just in that church, but in the the Presbytery generally had challenged me to go in the direction of ministry. I resisted that call initially. I wasn't, uh, I really didn't think that that was the, the right direction for me. But I think as, as time went on uh, and certain key events happened in terms of me having to reevaluate next steps, ministry became an obvious one and ministry through a, the ARPC became an even more obvious one. So. I, I don't think this was ever in doubt, but just to make it perfectly clear, that was why these changes happened. There wasn't any sort of, you know, animosity towards Down Zoo. Not, nothing bad happened. P Peter patiently walked through me, through with me, all, all of the different questions that I had and all the different issues that I was working through. And in the end, this is just where I think the Lord has called me. So. The plan at the moment, if all goes well, next September I start seminary. Um, I plan to start it in South Carolina uh, remotely right now, so uh, if all goes well I'll still be in Toronto, but there is a residency component that I have to complete eventually. Um, and as I mentioned, it will be with the ARPC, the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church. So if you've ever heard of Sinclair Ferguson, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm ending up. So I feel like I'm in good hands, and I feel like I always have been. I've, I've been really grateful for Down's Use Prayers and for uh, all of your friendship. Um, my family's been going here for about 10 years, and um, I never planned to go to Queens in the first place, and that was an unexpected turn that ended up being 
really good for me and, and for my family, and I'm hoping that this is just another unexpected turn that's also really good for all of us. So that would be the first uh, big piece of news that I had to share. And as far as why I was away for a few weeks uh, recently in August and with my family, uh, it's because we were traveling in Europe. We were in Albania uh, because I had met somebody and I had proposed to her while we were there. So I'm now engaged and thank you. And um, her name is Ina. Uh, she's, uh, she's a speech language pathologist and hopefully with uh, all the paperwork going through, you'll all be able to meet her soon. Um, I certainly plan to maintain a relationship with Downsview and so I'll be around, uh, albeit less frequently, uh, and I'll be around with Ina. So I just wanted to also wrap this up by saying I'm very grateful for the, the community, the support, the friendship. It's been, I think, almost 10 years or just over 10 years since my family first came here. Um, I wasn't as tall then. Um, I wasn't as, uh, I didn't have as much facial hair. A lot has happened. I went through high school at Downsview. I went through university at Downsview. And uh, I wouldn't change that for the world. And so just like I wouldn't change that for the world, I also wouldn't change the fact that here's where I'm going now and here's what I'm doing. And, and I know that that's, uh, the Lord's hand has been very obvious there. So thank you for all, all of your support and the, the well wishing. I know some of you knew, knew about this news earlier than others. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing where this all takes us. It's always that awkward Baptist clap, right? Do, do, do we what we do? I mean, we do in North America. We're happy, we're excited. So relax <laughs> and clap and enjoy it. Ilya and I have had lots of conversations, as you can imagine. So excited for him going to the ministry. What? Presbyterian? Okay, we got more conversations to have. And they've been wonderful conversations, as he said. We've got a lot of exercise. A lot of walking chats over this uh, past six or eight months that we've taken. And by God's grace, just what a wonderful, wonderful life it is for God to call him to. And so would you stand together with me, friends? And I want to pray for our brother here. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the reality of calling another one of your children to be a minister of the gospel. To do that, dear God, to declare the unsearchable riches of Christ. To do so first, I pray, Heavenly Father, for his own heart's good and Ina's good. And for the life that you've given them together, dear God, would you increase their joy day by day, year by year. Would you bless that union, dear God, such that the love that Christ has for his own would be joyfully and continually and consistently and in a growing way reflected through their marriage. We thank you for it, both of them. Thank you, dear God, for the technology that you have used to bring these two together across the miles. And for the church in Kingston and for our brethren throughout the Presbyterian denomination, we're grateful for them. They are without question our brothers and sisters in Christ. They love the gospel. We have much to learn and partner together in that with them. And so, dear God, for the unspeakable privilege of speaking the words of Christ, I pray, dear God, that your blessing would be upon Ilya, that you would be pleased, dear God, to give him a continuing affirmation of your call upon his life. Guard his heart and mind from the, the lying doubts of the devil that he would love for him to believe. For the, the disappointments and sadnesses even of people around him, dear God, would they be replaced with the certainty of your call upon his life. And for that conviction, dear God, we give you thanks and we ask that it would bear much fruit for the joy of people's salvation and ultimately for the glory of our great King. Thank you for his brotherly relationship with us and with me. Thank you, dear God, for the fellowship that we enjoy because of Christ and now the gospel partnership for which we rejoice and ask your particular blessing, Heavenly Father. Set him apart for your service in ways which indeed go beyond what he's asked or imagined. We pray with thanksgiving through Christ. Amen. Our next song will be Blessed Be Your Name. And uh, I think a bunch of us are seated, so we can stay seated for this one. 
We can do the intro for it. I'm losing my voice here. <laughs> and our final song for this section will be You Are My King.
Thanks, Katie. One of the things we say when we are preaching, and one of the things we say when we are preachers, is the best part of the sermon is the reading of God's Word. For that is coming directly from the mouth of our King, our Creator, our Governor, and the one who cares for us. So I've asked Ilya if he would indeed read the Scripture for us this morning. The scripture reading from to, for today is from the book of Acts, chapter 26. And we'll be reading the first 23 verses. So this is talking about Paul's early life, uh, leading into what the message is going to be about uh, in Galatians, regarding Paul's uh, old life. And this is uh, Paul's testimony before King Agrippa. So Acts chapter 26, starting from verse 1. Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then, all Jews know my manner of life from, youth, from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem, since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So then, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me. Excuse me. And those who were journeying with me, and when we had, and when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, "Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads." And I said, "Who are you, Lord?" And the Lord said, "I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness." not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first, and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the regions of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So, having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying to both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. The word of the Lord. I suppose it's good that as we sing and hear the 
truth of God proclaimed in the singing of his praises that it touches us emotionally. A little caught off guard there as we were singing. That was a wonderful reality of the brother of ours in church back in Thunder Bay. Bob was 92 years old. His favorite hymn was And Can It Be? His second favorite song was Amazing Love. It's almost one's a contemporary version of the hymn. And the idea of a 92-year-old man who had walked with the Lord for a number of years, he didn't know the words. I remember Bob would just be there and he just would not be restrained from singing God's praises. And he would just sit in the pew and I could, I was, we would just sit across from him. Bob would be, Bob, I love, he would get the word. And you know, he didn't know the words and he just would not be restrained from adding his voice to the angels and praising his king. And it just, it's really something for me to just think of the Apostle Paul as he gives his life to the proclamation of that word and is gripped by that truth that it ought to grip up, grip us as well, even when we're not all the greatest singers. Apparently, Andrea, losing your voice sounded pretty darn good to me. Uh, but when we come before God and his people this way, to present our bodies as living sacrifices, it ought to get to us and it ought to hit us emotionally every once in a while. Please turn to the first chapter of the gospel, or the gospel <laughs> where Paul articulates the gospel at the very least in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. If you like, you do inside your song sheet, I think, have an outline for the sermon. If that's helpful for you, help yourself. If not, you can leave it right there. But We began last week, as you know, to look at this magnificent letter where the Apostle Paul is certainly emotional. And Paul is not sad and choked up and teary-eyed, at least not in the first few chapters. Paul is the angry Apostle where you see him in the book of Galatians. In fact, the Apostle Paul, writing what was probably his first letter, chronologically in the New Testament, is exercised and upset and concerned and frankly angry in a way that we don't often see him. And he's angry and frustrated because these folks at these churches have added to the gospel because they became convinced that Jesus was simply not enough. Brothers and sisters, let me caution you as we walk through this series. We are not immune to adding to Jesus because we believe Jesus is not enough. That's what sin is. Sin is when Jesus is not sufficient. Jesus is not enough or Jesus is not good enough. Jesus is not big enough or quick enough or fast enough or does not do enough of what we are saying we are praying for. Praying to God is not the same as demanding He do what we want the way we want it when we want it. Brothers and sisters, if there is any fruit of repentance that should be continually flowing from our lives as those who have believed and are seeking to live out the gospel, it is the fruit that shows that we know that we live under the supreme hand of a holy God who every breath that we have is a gift from his hand. Every moment of happiness is always more than we deserve. Every moment of difficulty is always less than we have earned. Brothers and sisters, we have before us a letter in the book of Galatians where the Apostle Paul is deeply and passionately and to the depths of his soul concerned about the beauty of Christ and the glory of the gospel of God. And he will not stand for us for a moment to think and to reflect that somehow Jesus is not all that we need. And so let's pray, shall we, as we continue in what we began last week. Father in heaven, for these moments that we have in your most holy word, I ask now, Heavenly Father, for those moments that we have that we will push back, that we will believe this is not possible for us, 
that we will believe in many ways, whether we recognize it, that we're not tempted to sin like this, that we're not tempted to sin in this way, that we're immune. This is not, a, it's always someone else. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you will give us the liberty of self-examination, that you will grant us the safety of recognizing that self-examination, safe in the arms of Jesus, is just that, a safe place for us to examine how we are living lives that we are seeking to reflect the gospel by. Help us, I pray, Heavenly Father, as we look into your word now. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be pleased to convict, encourage, rebuke, whatever it is that we require from this word. Would you do it to the glory of your Son, our Lord's name. It is upon his authority that we plead with you these things. In Christ's name, amen. We began, as I said, last week to seek to be better equipped to do what I believe the call of this book is. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, Far be it for me that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world was crucified to me and I to the world. Determined to make the reflection of the gospel the goal of and for your life, friends. I believe the Apostle Paul wants us at Downsview Baptist Church to be better equipped to be people who reflect what we value most highly and what we value most highly would be the beauty of our Lord Jesus. That boasting about him would be what our lives are identified as being about. That this church would be a church that people know of and expect to find a place where we enjoy bragging on Jesus. That he's the one that we are living for. Not just worshiping on Sunday morning or so forth, but throughout the week that the lives that we have indeed are a reflection of what we love the most. This morning, we will look at the entire first chapter of the book of Galatians. We will look by slightly and shortly reviewing the first four verses that we saw last week, and then three thoughts through the rest of the book. By no means is this an exhaustive look at it, but I feel like it's important that we see what the Apostle Paul is saying in its broadest scope. Anchor. Here's your thought for today. Anchor your boasting in the cross in what God has given to you, not in what you are striving to give God. Anchor your boasting in the cross in what God has given to you, not what you are striving to give to God. And we will see the Apostle Paul's calling to preach it, that is the gospel, we will see the Apostle Paul's credibility that we should trust it. We will see the content of it. We will see ultimately the consequence that God has given us the gospel for. And that is, again, that we might be better equipped to boast in the cross. The Apostle Paul is passionate that in these passages we would not believe the lie that so many at these Galatian churches, you remember it's a province more than a city, it's a number of churches more than one church, these churches that have believed this lie. And it's a lie, brothers and sisters, that you are being offered nowadays. It is a lie that you are being attacked with. A lie that your life and the life of those around you are in serious attack from a soul in peril kind of lie. This is not the periphery of gospel ministry. This is at the heart of Christian living. And this lie, whether we realize it, feel it, sense it or not, we are all in danger from it because you are tempted to believe it. You don't think you are. I don't think I am. The Galatian churches didn't realize they were. Brothers and sisters, the lie is this. That we can add something to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what the Apostle Paul is so concerned about. And you and I must understand how naturally inclined we are to want to add something. Just, just a little something to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. To just add just a little something to the gospel. 
It's almost right. You got almost got it proper. It's almost correct. Let me just add a little something. And the reason, brothers and sisters, that I know that we are immune, not immune to this and susceptible to fall prey to believing this lie is because the scriptures warn us again and again and again not to fall prey to this. Friends, when you see warnings in the Bibles, please don't believe the lie of the devil that it's always for someone else. It may not be for us in exactly the same way as everyone else or in exactly the time, but brothers and sisters, do not brush by it. The devil loves that. Loves that you think you're immune. Loves to think, oh, listen, it's not for you, it's just for someone else. Any of you have read C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters or Randy Alcorn's Lord Falgren's Letters, which is a contemporary version. One of the lines that the, the devil who is training his young apprentice he tells him the great truth of what we will do to get the Christians to not believe the Bible is not to tell them God isn't true, but to tell them they don't have to worry about us. There's no temptation that they have to worry about. There's no tempters. There's no liars out there. Everything's fine. I'm in Christ. No problem. The devil loves you and I to believe that we are not open to just this kind of attack. And dear friends, it's part of the reason that I get so passionate thinking about these texts is because we are not immune from it. Because we are tempted to believe this lie because we like it. We like this because we like ourselves. And more, we like what we think. And we think the things we think are the right things to think. We think the way to live is of course the right way to live. No one is out there as a Christian saying, I know the right way to live and I'm going to ignore it and just do my own thing even though I know it's wrong. There is something about liking this lie because we are convinced that we're living properly. That our service is what it should be. That the way we think and feel about one another, about the ministry of the church, about what's happening on Sunday morning, about what's happening in the contemporary world as Christianity has an effect on it. We are so sure of our opinions, aren't we? We're not generally sitting around saying, you know what, I've been thinking something that's incorrect. Let's have a chat about it. It's not how we think. We sit around our campfires and coffee shops. We sit around all the time, so determined, on the way to church and on the way home from church, discussing the things that we are so sure we are right about. And brothers and sisters, that is the very thing that leaves us open to the temptation to just add a little something to Christ and what he's done. Where, brothers and sisters, are you and where are you sure that you are finding your joy and the root of your satisfaction, of the peace of your status, of the place you look for affirmation and contentment. Are you sure it's in the finished work, the completed glorious work of our Lord Jesus Christ? Or is it Jesus plus the work that I do on his behalf, the Christian service that I give, to add just a little bit of my efforts that are just a little better than the other folks around me? Do I, do I find my security in my comparisons between myself and other Christians' lifestyles, their intensity, their amount of work, the way they're living, or even in the wider, wider body of Christ? I realize, friends, I'm front-loading my application, but it's so important that we see that this is not a dry, generic truth that we say, have we fallen into the trap of the Galatians? No. Here is the lesson. Let's go home. Friends, the Apostle Paul, I believe, has a pastoral concern with that fine, fine line between boasting and blaspheming. The lie, the adding to Christ, is always offered as just that little something we can achieve. Do you ever notice that? You ever notice that little areas that we get just a little proud of, that we're doing a little better than other people? That it's actually the kind of things that we can do when we invent another little something. It's never something we can't find the way to do it. It's always the things we're already good at. The things we've already been doing. And often the things that other people are not doing so well. 
so we can find ourselves just a little propped up. Before we know it, we've added to the completed, beautiful, glorious work of our Savior. Brothers and sisters, the call of the book of Galatians is that we would be equipped to live for only the glory of our King. And the Apostle Paul is so eager that we understand that. That he actually opens this letter. you remember last week in the first four verses of chapter 1? Let me read them to you. Paul an apostle, not from men or through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Verse 3 says, Grace to you and peace from, listen now, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us, from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Do you see there the calling of the Apostle Paul? That's what an apostle is. It's someone who is sent, not just as an ambassador, as an emissary, but with a task here. He's been sent as an apostle. We heard that from that passage in Acts 26 and even the passage in Ephesians 3 that I read. This calling to preach it and the credibility to trust it. Not from men or through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. He says, you should trust what I'm saying because my credentials are that God himself has taught me this. His calling, his credibility, and indeed the content. Raised from the dead in verse 1 and verse 4, who gave himself... Remember we labored that last week, that all through the scriptures, before the Jewish leaders in John 10, Jesus made the point that I've come to lay down my life for the sheep. Before his own in John chapter 15, greater love has no man than this. Then he lay down his life for his friends. That is, he would, would articulate through his apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, that God in verse 32 would deliver him up for us all. That we are those, even in chapter 2 of the book of Galatians, where the Apostle Paul tells us that it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. The content of the gospel is all there. It's all about giving himself for our sins to deliver us from the ugliness of this evil age according to the plan and the purpose of our Father. And what is the consequence of all of that? The calling, the credibility, the content. The consequence is to whom be glory forever and ever. It is a boasting in the cross. Brothers and sisters, never believe that the gospel has come for the ultimate purpose of saving you and I from our sins. That is pen ultimate, meaning it's underneath the ultimate. The highest reason, the goal of the gospel is that Jesus Christ would be boasted in. That we would praise him. That's what we'll spend eternity doing. Praising a saved, redeemed people, the glory of our King. And now the amazing thing to me is you look through the rest of chapter 1, is you see these same categories. You see these same categories, but Paul just moves them around a little bit. And so if you come down to verse 6, all the way down to verse 10, you see here the content of it. The content of the gospel. Just as he articulated it in shorthand in verse 4, in verse 5, here from verses 6 to 10. So if the overall thought is anchor your boasting in the cross, in what God has given you, not what you're trying to give to God. The first thought here is anchor your boasting in the cross in the gospel God has given you, not in the gospel you invent for God. Anchor your boasting. Where are you going to put down your roots for boasting? You're going to anchor them in the gospel that God has given to us. And interestingly enough, you notice in verse 6 where the Apostle Paul is very exercised because the Galatian believers are not doing that. He says in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Verse 7 says, not that there is one, 
But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Some of you have different versions. It doesn't say accursed. It's literally a Greek word, katakane. It's a Greek word which speaks of condemnation. It is a Greek word that it says, someone who comes preaching a false gospel is cursed and damned to hell. I'm not supposed to talk like that on Sunday morning. Right? You know, well, that, that, the Bible didn't, th that's not the way we think about this. Dear friends, the reason we don't think about it like that is because sin lands so lightly on us. It's like a snowflake that just hits the pavement and sits there for a bit. It's really no big deal. And yet, why is snow such a big problem? Because there's hundreds and millions and tens of billions of them that just build up and build up and build up and build up. And before we know it, the little bit that we've added to the gospel, the little something of our own merit, our own works, our own demand for approval, it weighs down and it weighs down. The Apostle Paul is very exercised here. Frankly, I often think of him being most upset at the Corinthian church. But he's not nearly as upset at the Corinthian churches because they were immature new believers. These folks know better. So it's most of us. It's me he's writing to. I'm astonished how quickly you are deserting. Notice how he says in verse 6, not deserting the gospel, deserting him. A turning away by adding to the gospel is a turning away from the author of the gospel. It's a turning away from him. John Piper says, he's saying that those who are false teachers should go to hell. That's how serious this is. That's how, friends, how serious he is that we might boast in the cross and only in the cross. That those who do not do that, and are seeking to tear you away from the content of the gospel should be eternally condemned. Look what they're saying. Look over at verse chapter 3. Chapter 2, excuse me. Chapter 2, verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. The Apostle Paul is eager that they understand that Christ himself, his completed work is sufficient any actions, any works of even religious working, even religious activities of the law. And we'll get into all the details of that in the coming weeks. Anything like that that is added to the gospel means the content of the gospel has been altered. As Tim Keller said last week, gospel revision is gospel replacement. Gospel being revised just a little something added to it. Just, just the idea of being circumcised as a, as a Gentile believer. It's no big deal. That's what these guys, these false teachers are ultimately wanting. It's the one work of the law. Just this one little thing and we'll be fine. The Apostle Paul says that gospel revision is in fact gospel replacement. The gospel is being replaced by a gospel that is simply trusting God. Jesus surrendering to Christ that's the whole point that's the goal and brothers and sisters in the midst of Paul's angst here that's the very good news of the content of the gospel we don't have to do the work he's done it for us we may not do the work since there's no point he has done it 
He has done everything that is required to please his heavenly father. The holiness, the righteousness has been earned. The debt has been completely paid. Jesus is simply saying to you this morning, listen, just trust me. I know it's countercultural. I know it doesn't seem right in yourself. I know there seems something natural that you want to do. That's why the gospel is so unique and so different than any other message of salvation the world has ever offered. Just trust me. You can't do what needs to be done and you need not do. I've done it. Trust me. Perhaps you're listening today and perhaps God by his spirit is bringing that upon you for the first time. Just surrender. Stop. Just stop. Just lay yourself bare before the Lord. Help me. Save me. I am yours. Just surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. That, brothers and sisters, is the content of the gospel. He says there in Galatians chapter 1, and moving on, verse 10. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul is so eager there to understand that he's going to love these Galatians enough that they might not like him for a while. They might not listen for a while. They might be turned off a little bit. They might move away. They may not be at church next week. They may not give like they used to. They're no longer going to serve because someone is attacking them, it feels like, at the very base of their life. But you see why the lie is so horrible? Because it's so tempting. We like what we do. We like what we add to the little, it's just a little bit that we add. Paul is saying the contents of the gospel is Jesus first and last. Jesus plus nothing equals everything, as one writer put it. And again, brothers and sisters, that is the subtle difference between boasting in the content of the gospel and blaspheming the author of it himself. If we are to anchor our boasting in the cross with the gospel we've been given, not one that we invent. Our second thought here from 11 to 23 is both Paul's calling and credibility is put together in anchoring, or anchoring his boasting in the cross in the revelation that God has given, not a revelation that we invent. And you're saying the revelation of the gospel and the gospel seem tied together. They certainly are. But the source of the gospel... Where did this revelation come from and come through? Do you notice how the Apostle Paul's credibility is so closely connected here? He makes it so clear, and this would have been enough of the entire sermon just to camp on verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. That's our goal. When David comes up here to preach and David comes there to preach and Ilya is going to be preaching. Any of us as deacons want to teach and preach the truth of the gospel. You and I as witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. What we are saying is not man's gospel. And by the way, it's, it's an aside thought. But it's one of the apologetic ways you can help people understand the sufficiency of the scriptures. People say, well, this is just man-made rules. This is not divine. I say, are you kidding? What would man, what man would ever make up something this impossible to live? What man would possibly make something up like this gospel that we have no hope of achieving on ourselves? Man-made religions are always something that happens that has contains at its base, we can do this. Therefore, we'll say this is the way we should live. No one made up. The story of the gospel. One of the ways you know that is man would not have made up something that is so difficult, frankly impossible for us to achieve on our own. The Apostle Paul's calling to preach this and credibility that we should believe this are rooted in the fact this is not man's gospel. In fact, he says, for, how do I know that? Verse 12, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. But I received it as a revelation of Jesus Christ, from Jesus Christ. 
That's why we asked Ilya to read the, the testimony of the Apostle Paul in Acts 26. He, he recounts his Damascus Road experience. No one stopped him like an Ethiopian eunuch on a chariot and said, let me explain to you what that word means. Nobody came and appeared to him like the Apostle Paul and found Timothy and, and, and taught him the, the details of the scriptures. No one came to him with an open Bible, as it were, and, and talked to him about this. No, no. Paul says, my credibility is because this is not man's gospel, because I didn't get it through man. I didn't get it from man. And in fact, what I had heard about it, that I ignored in verse 13, you've heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And how I was advancing in Judaism beyond people of my own age, among my own people. So zealous was I for what? The traditions of my fathers. Major red flag in warning, brothers and sisters. It's, it's our tribe, isn't it? This is our tribe. This is our Baptists. That's the way we've always done it. <laughs> right? And we got to own that. There is something so wonderful about the heritage of gospel ministry, gospel preaching, gospel living, church life. There is something to be given thanks for. And again and again to be praising God for those who have blazed the trail before us. And who have helped us to understand how we ought to live before the Lord. But friends, we must never, 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 capital N, <laughs> never, never think that the traditions, that the way we've done it, that the way my grandmother or my mom or my kids or my professor or our pastor told us to do it. That is never at the level of the revelation that God has given us in Christ in his word. He says in verse 16, God was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. When he did, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Nor I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. I went away into Arabia and returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went back again to see Cephas and others. Just so you understand why the Apostle Paul is making such a point of this, is that the accusation against him was that, oh, you just went up to Jerusalem with those new guys. We are we're Jewish people who understand the old covenant scriptures. That's what the false teachers are saying in Galatia. Paul's just a Johnny come lately. He, he was, he'd just been up there with those new folks with that new teaching, the new perspective on how we're supposed to please God. But we really know how, how it is. Paul goes, wait a minute. Those other folks might be a problem, but that's not where I've come from. That's not where I've learned this. I didn't receive anything from man or through man. In fact, I made a point of staying away from most of the people. And that's what he's articulating there. Do you see his calling and his credentials are tied to the fact that his boasting in the cross is anchored in the revelation that he was given. Not a revelation he invented. Which frankly is exactly what these false teachers are doing. And where does that lead him? That leads him all the way down to of chapter 1. He says, even though they were persecuting me, and even though I tried to destroy the people of the way, as they were called, he says, nevertheless, they glorified God because of me. Something to the sufficient work and person of Christ. May God guard our hearts and minds from such a blasphemous act and instead cause us to surrender, to surrender our lives to the Lord Jesus that we would be those who boast in the cross. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for these moments you've given us in your word. And even as we sing in response, dear God, I pray you will grip us emotionally, passionately, eagerly, that these words would not just roll off our backs, as it were, but that you, Heavenly Father, would give us a focus, a self-examination, a liberty to examine ourselves before the Lord himself. Cause us, Heavenly Father, to never, never negotiate the content of the gospel and to see that it is to be believed because of the calling, the credibility, even of your apostles, that it has come directly from your lips. This beautiful, beautiful, 
examination of the cross that just should thrill our hearts. I pray you'll cause that to be the case in our lives, dear God. Would the consequence of all of this be that we're a church family very equipped to glorify our Lord and King. We humbly pray in His name. Amen. The song we will be closing with is Heart of Worship. And excuse me if I sing a little quieter than usual. My voice is uh, a little, a little toughed out today. <laughs>
So another good thing uh, with the, today's uh, technology, if you forgot part of message pastor preach or the song we sing, so we can go on internet and rewind it in our mind to refresh and remember. We losing our memory, we losing our years, <laughs> kids are growing and we are blooming in different colors, but God never changed. And all we do on this earth is preparing our life to meet Him. We love Him and we would like to thank Him every day, for every morning, for everything He giving us. And I would like to ask you to stand with me in close uh, prayer in the Heavenly Father, God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, we thank you for your son. We thank you for that he came on this earth and prepared salvation for every human being. We thank you that you find us in this world and put on this way. Lord, we thank you for that we come in your presence without anything that simply open your heart or hearts to you. We ask in your blessing. Help us every day follow your word. Help us remember what you want for us. Enjoy that blessing you've given us and remember your demand to fulfill. Please, leave us and guide us on the way home. In Jesus' name, Amen. Bless you.